So I'm going to talk about a couple of things, and I'm going to use memories. I'm going to use pictures that are on my wall. I'm going to share what's happened in the last seven years. I'm going to share with you what I did, what I am going to do. And I have one big challenge for you today. And as you saw on the picture behind me, I'm a little bit naked in front of you today because normally on my right hand side there is my service dog, which is called Yup. And um, Yup is the only service dog in the world with stage fright, and that's not a good thing with my profession. But he doesn't like flying, so, so Yup is at home and people always want to do what, what is Yup able to do? Well, there's a big difference what he can do and what he actually does. Um, but you can open the doors for me, picking stuff up from the ground, getting me dressed and undressed in the morning, getting a beer out of the fridge. I taught him that, that was illegal, but I, my friend thinks it's very funny. But Yup is my biggest companion, and normally he's always with me, because Yup is the best, most hospitable, nicest service provider I, I actually know. So now I brought Tom, one of my colleagues, is sitting in the back, and I gave Tom treats the whole day, and then he does everything for me. So that works as well. But before I'm gonna introduce myself, before I'm even gonna tell you who I am or what I'm doing here, I'm gonna take you back to a moment. And that moment is the 16th of June, 2010. 10. And as I wake up, it's, it's dark around me and I have absolutely no clue who I am or where I am or what is happening. One in my bed and it's, it's wet around me. I remember thinking like how can we how can we wet it in the rain? It's, it's, it's summer. And later on I remember to see a portion of my blood. Because after a 16 hour work day with some beers in the way, I'm standing in front of my motorcycle at three o'clock at night and my friends would pick me up but I couldn't the last moment. The cabs didn't drive anymore and I remember thinking, ah, oh, those, those 10 minutes, those 10 minutes back to my place, I drove them for a thousand times. And I set up in, in the first turn where I should have taken the right turn, I go straight and I hit the sidewalk, I fly like 10 meters and I land between two parked cars inside the pavement. No one even knew that I had stepped in that motorcycle. And I can't remember my accident, but I can remember waking up and a little kind of panic begins because I'm so afraid to fall asleep. Because if I fall asleep, then and it's a bright night and I start counting the stars, making signs, doing everything not to fall asleep. And that's the battle I lose. So between three o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning, I'm there by myself and I still have no clue who I am, or where I am, what just happened. There's just one voice in my head that shouts, Nick, now you completely ruined your life. You, all your dreams are over at the moment. And it's six o'clock in the morning and with my right hand side, I grab, with my right hand, I grab my cell phone out of my pocket, which is still working and I dial 112, which is our emergency number, and a very friendly lady picks up the phone. But I still don't know who I am. The only thing that I can remember is the cell phone for my dad, because when we were 10 years old, we needed to learn that number. It's 06, 51, 57. I won't recall the whole number here. And I think I shouted over 30 times against the lady, and just locate my phone, because that's something that I saw. On police television and for 45 minutes they search with four cars and several seven motorcycles until quarter to seven in the morning and against this nice lady on the phone I turn my head to the right hand side and I actually see the sign of one of the cars which is only parked a meter in front of me and just a few minutes later a blue car stops in front of my feet and a man and a woman steps out and I heard her we were saying in the radio, we found, we found him. They stabilized my neck and they moved me to the hospital in Amsterdam. And when I wake up, there's all my brothers and sisters are standing in front of my bed. I think I'm in an IC unit or a trauma care. And 
There's a big doctor with a white coat coming in and he says, Nick, you have a spinal cord injury and you're paralyzed from the chest down. This is the hard part of today. I see some people looking here at the front where I was just going to be such a 45 minutes, but I tell this story about four or five times a week. And why? Because it feels like for the first time in years, I was able to make new choices, choices to make my life happy. And it might sound, sound strange, but I'm kind of grateful, graceful for the 16th of June, 2010. So who am I? Because I didn't introduce myself yet. My name is Nick van den Adel and I work as a motivational speaker. And motivational speaker is kind of a strange word because I'm not here to motivate you today. I'm just here to tell my story. I travel all around the world to give keynotes like these ones. And Got three companies now, with a lot of people employed, and I'm a happy man. So when I was 15 years old, my father told me, Nick, start working instead of just giving fucking money for me. And I started working in the hospitality industry, and I loved, I absolutely loved my job. And I went to the States for a couple of years, went to Africa and Asia for a couple of years, and I came back in the Netherlands, and I thought, I'm going to study hospitality management. So I did. I studied four years of hospitality management, and after four years, I read the labor agreement. I should have done that four years earlier. And then I thought, that's not going to work. I'm going to be a consultant. So I got a very big tie, an even bigger suit, a big BMW, an even bigger salary, and an even bigger ego. But I was completely not happy with my life. I grew up in a little village and I was living in Amsterdam, a city that I didn't understand. I was doing a job that I didn't love. I wanted to have a girlfriend for so many years, but how was somebody going to love me when I didn't love myself anymore? What did I do? I bought a motorcycle to feel life alive again. And you know how that ended. Now, this is not a sad story because there is a very, very, very lucky man here or a very happy man here in front of you today as well. I went to rehab in Utrecht, which is in one of the city centers in the Netherlands. And after uh, three years, I completely, but absolutely, completely fell in love with my occupational therapist. And she fell in love with me as well, by the way. That's good for the story. And three months later, we were living together and a couple of years after that, we got married. And it's illegal to get a relationship with one of your occupational therapists in the Netherlands, but I am. Who gives a, uh -huh. I was a happy man. And three years ago, uh, Puck and Fien were born. I normally do this when there are a lot of females in the audience. It always works. And one year ago, Anna was born, and, and we were so happy. And I remember the, the winter of 2010. It was a very soft, but very snowy, white winter. And I was still in rehab. I was lying with, with six other youngsters that bought a motorcycle in the summer. And at 10 o'clock at night, I illegally went out of the rehab center. I was just able to drive my wheelchair, and Right in front of the rehab, there was Kim in a very little car. And I stepped into this car and we stopped in a very little snow street in, in Utrecht. And that's where Kim lived. And I fitted just inside of her apartment. And there I was seated for the first time in years besides the woman of my friends. And so the days tell you the death of my life, I meant to the love of my life. And we were lying next to each other in bed, and I was actually struggling with her legs a little bit, and I thought, wow, she could have been shaved for a time. <laughs> but then I realized I was actually struggling with my own legs for a half 
Yeah. Kim and me, we were completely in love, completely in love. And getting, getting kids, I can just recommend it to everyone because you don't need to do anything anymore at home. Why do you need a motor when you can have this? And I was so incredibly happy. I was on the top of my life. Kim is my best medicine against my pain. And everything went well with the love of my life. Well, not everything, because after a couple of months, I got another complication in my neck, which is called a searing and where all the other youngsters in my room went outside, went back to their families, my body was getting worse and worse and worse. And how can I explain it to you how it is to, to just cry yourself into sleep every single night because I can't win it from the pain. How to explain it to you how it is to that everything, really everything, even death, may happen because the pain is too severe. So we went to the best medical institute in Europe, which is called in Germany, and in Germany there was my savior, Dr. Hans Kleekamp. And they reopened my neck completely again. And when I woke up, I couldn't move anything anymore. So the 10% of my body that was still working didn't do anything. And I thought like, shit, I had that spinal cord injury. And I thought that was my deepest belly. And now I've got that stupid searings in my neck. And how low can it go? And I couldn't stay there anymore in Germany because there was no contact between me and the doctors. There was no contact between me and the nurses. And I got fired on Wednesday and I couldn't do anything by myself anymore. So on Thursday I was taking a shower with one of my friends and there was my father in tears. And he said, Nick, you need to come home because your mom only has a couple of weeks to live. Stop the pain. And every time I thought I was finally there, it got deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'm not here to tell you sad stories about my life, but we said goodbye to my mom and she died away two weeks after. It was a beautiful time. But something magical happened over there because my accident learned me how to fall and my mom taught me how to die. And from that moment on, I realized that I was not going to be afraid of living anymore. From that moment on, I realized that it was my decision to create a happy life for myself. With the downfalls and with all the lucky moments. So I thought, let's, let's write a book about it. And I did. So in 2015, when I wrote Crash, I hit all the national and international TV programs and that is not so important but I finally got the stadium that I wanted to do and I wanted to tell people my story and this is not about promoting the book but there's a sentence beneath it, and I hope you guys can read it and that some people need a brush with death before they start living and that's me some people like me really need to fall hard before they start living there is a really happy guy here in front of you there's really a happy guy in front of you but i can't recommend the spinal cord injury to anyone so this is not only going to be a mr positive story this is just a story about life so i thought let's um, take you back into my into my living room and in my living room there are all kind of pictures and i'm just going to grab some pictures once in a while and there are stories behind those pictures so one of the companies that I own, we do a lot of mystery visits in the Netherlands and then we're just going to look for strange signs which happen to have anything to do with, with wheelchairs. So um, I think they're actually really funny, like a very nice wheelchair ramp. Don't put wheelchairs in the trash can. I thought it was a very nice one as well. We found it in England. Yeah, standing up. And uh, don't put wheelchairs from the stairs. It's a funny world that we're living in. And, 
just the nice pictures. So, one of the things that, that always struck me that there were a lot of guys in my rehab center as well that were obsessed about being able to walk again, being obsessed about curing that spinal injury. And I was obsessed about being happy again in my life. And it's still a struggle, but it works more often than it doesn't. But technology is going to help us in the next coming years. Um, we have a company that uh, rates all kind of accommodations for blind people, deaf people, people in a wheelchair, the whole thing. And technology is going to do a lot for us in the next couple of years. Eh? The ESCO, Skeleton, of course. Stem cell therapy. Technology is going fast. Microchips in your spine. And this is going to make our life more convenient. But not necessarily is going to make our lives more happy. And what I did, it's just my solution. I completely invested all my savings that I had in coaching, in counseling, talking to people. Because in the three hours that I was lying on the ground in June, the big tie, my big salary, the big car, nothing of all of that was in my head. The only thing that I was thinking about was the, the love of my family, the love of my friends. So I started investing in that part. Yes, technology is going to help us. Yes, in about 50 or 100 years, final work injuries don't exist anymore. But in the meantime, how much do you invest in being happy? I'm not here to tell you how to do so. Coaching, counseling, talking to people is my idea of being happy. And somebody that really understood that was Marcel. One of us, Marcel was one of my nurses in the rehab center and we had a very old building. So in the morning, they put me in the shower chair and for 28 years, 28 years, I was able to be to poop all by myself. And suddenly somebody put me naked on a sour chair and there was a little blanket going over my lap. And you know, just as good as I do, that the shower chairs are open on the backside. And they drove me 30 meters over the hallway because that's where, where the toilets were. And I was actually standing in a queue each morning because there were other patients in front of me. And I got sadder and sadder and sadder every morning because that was the, stay, the start of my day. And they put me in above the, the toilet and there were two klismas going in because I've got this terrible service dog that is not able to put klismas in. It was a joke, by the way. And they closed the curtain, not the door, because the nurses needed to be able to get to me soon. And it was just a very sad start of the day and Marcel one of the nurses he saw that so at one morning I see a very big hand coming around the curtain and says Nick do you want some coffee with it and that completely changes my start of the day so now you know what you have to do every morning get yourself coffee no but looking for other people meeting other people Finding nice things to do. Face challenges in your life. And speaking about challenges, this is going to be the first challenge that I'm going to give you. Every year I organize a handbike battle. And the handbike battle is the biggest handbike event in the world at the moment. We take approximately 150 people with spinal cord injuries up to a mountain in Austria. About 20 k's and about... 1,500 meters up, and we climb a mountain together. But it's not about the battle. It's not about climbing that mountain. Last year, I had a youngster of 14 coming in, and her parents only saw her in an IC unit, rehab, and all medical conditions. And they were standing at the finish line, and for the first time in her life, they saw her doing something which was impossible. And at night she was dancing like crazy with other people on the floor. 
This week is not only about climbing a mountain, the week is about learning from each other. And that literally changed my life. I was used to putting my clothes on in a bed and then my two fellow roommates thought I was crazy because then I learned for the first time five years ago how to do it in a wheelchair. We have talks about how it is to, to live with pain, talks about how it is to have a shitty sex life. talks about how it is to be incredibly nervous to step into an airplane because I'm afraid that something is going to happen. Your handicap is in your head. Look around you here. The people that are standing here or your father or your mother or your family, everyone, everyone has a handicap. That wheelchair is not your handicap. Your handicap is up here for 100%. And I strongly believe that it's a choice. I even hate the word. I strongly believe it's a choice how you would deal with it in your head. And it's not easy. I was completely shocked to come to Ireland and learn about the healthcare system. I was completely shocked that 75% of all the people here is not working. I feel so blessed and lucky with our healthcare system. But even there, I met people in Africa that have responded to an injury and can't be happy out here. So, what's your dream? What's your goal? What are you going to do to live a meaningful, happy life? Everyone as a handicap. As somebody that completely understands, this is, is Ali. I didn't told you this yet, but due to my searings, that complication in my head, I take about 37 pills every day to suppress the pain for a little bit. Carbamentine, amitriptyline, morphine, everything that can be eaten, I swallow it. And I recently learned that carbamentine and amitriptyline are two antidepressants that explains why I'm so happy all the time. But my morning always, always starts crap, shitty, really. And there was a happy man over here for two days in a week. I lose that Betty and I'm in the bed and I put my sheets over my head and close to print and then I don't want to see anyone. What I do at that moment, I go to the gas station where, where Ali works because I'm just angry, sad, afraid of what's going to happen in the future. And I step into my big big car with like a lift in or an elevator, how you call it in it, and it takes me 45 minutes to put gas in myself, so Ali always helps me with that, and when I arrive at this gas station, I blink my headlight twice, and I wave at him, and he says, like, Nick, I saw you, and I put my car next to the gas station, and Ali is always, always so irritatingly happy in the morning. He says, Nick, what can I do for you? I just, man, just, just fill up the car, please. And he starts putting gas in. And he looks at me and he says, Nick, you're not doing so well today. I said, no, Ali, this is just the day that I, I can't win it from the pain. And he looks back at me there and he says, Nick, what, what are you actually going to do here? I'm like, Ali, I'm actually not here to, to fill up my car. I'm actually here just to just to become happy again. And the whole posture of this little man changes and with a big smile on his face, and he, how long are you in your wheelchair actually? I said, now, eight years, Ali? Then I would switch doctors if I were you. So it's a humor that Ali and I had. Then I give my credit card with my four digit number, of that's good idea, all different story. And Ali went back to his office and halfway there he turns around and says, Nick, cup of coffee on the way. And he, yeah, thank you, Ali. Gets back to his office, gets a cup of coffee and a Red Bull because Red Bull, Red Bull helps against everything, says Ali. And with a smile on my face, I drive into the day. 
Now, I strongly believe that we as humans have a choice every day again, either to look for Alice in your life or to become one, even if the, dark, the day starts with pain or other complications. Now, every year I celebrate my spinal cord injury, and we call it Spinal Cord Sunday, and um, 364 days in a year, I do have the negative side of it, but can I celebrate it then one time in a year? We really celebrate this. We open the champagne and I invite my father. My mom, of course, died. In the meantime, I invite my brothers, my sisters, my close friends, and we celebrate all the good things that that spinal injury brought me. And I tell Kim how incredibly blessed we are with three youngsters. Well, together with an au pair that makes my house holes with five women. I don't know what's worse, a spinal cord injury or that thick, but we would just celebrate life. And that's something that I want to do with you today as well. Look for each other. Look for the good things that life brings you as well. And then we're back into my living room again, and I just grabbed picture after picture about my life. I'm not here to motivate you. I'm not here to tell you how to live a happy life. I'm just here to tell you my story. And there's only one person that I didn't mention yet, and that's Joop, and I always close with Joop. Joop is the most happiest, hospitable, nicest person in the world. He's always happy, so he gets a happy. Because I said I am, Joop is always happy. How much pain I have, he's always able to help me. But every day he, taught me, he teaches me one incredibly important thing, and it is that it's my choice, my choice, to live a happy life. Thanks so much for your attention.